today you've heard the star already. You've heard Monsignor Swedlin. He uh, was a man who was very influential in my life, in my young life as a Catholic, because I converted to the church in 1996. And in 1998, I got a call from a Father Stuart Swetland in Illinois. I had no idea who he was or what he was about. But I was about to enter about 13 years of some of the most pleasant years of my life, working at the University of Illinois, teaching uh, there and working with him and under him as we attempted to have a ministry, a, a both of a spiritual intellectual nature to our students. And to this day, I think we can point to many young families. I can point to, I count, I think 13, maybe 15 young men that are in the priesthood or once my students. Five young women who are in religious life uh, who are in, uh, that were my students. And Monsignor can count many more than that. So we have much to be thankful for to God. I'm thankful that I can see my friend and spiritual director again. So thank you again for having us here tonight or today. And uh, I'm hoping that we can continue learning this afternoon. But just to refresh our hearts and our minds, let's begin with a prayer, shall we? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Most gracious Heavenly Father, your love for us is so enormous and so undeserved. And yet we thank you that you've made us your children in our elder brother, Jesus Christ. Help us on this earth to be the continuing incarnation that is the church, that he, where he brought divinity down to earth. Help us to embody that and to live it out. Help us to do your will as we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. You have in front of you, at least I hope you do, a sheet of paper which gives you a bit of an outline of what I'm going to talk about today. The reason I did this is I thought it might be useful to you in your taking notes that you might like to jot things down. But the first thing I'd like us to do this, this afternoon is to take just a moment and I wonder how many of you got a chance to read the summary that I sent in earlier about what this talk is all about. Would you take literally a minute and just read this to yourself? So let's begin with the question today. From what you read, what do you think this talk is about? Education. Education. Education? That's the second talk. <laughs> the, uh, the, the breakout session I'm going to actually talk about. I'm going to talk about the three transcendentals in this talk as well. But in the next talk, I'm going to ferret that out more to help us understand those a little bit better. Anybody else? What, what else did you read here? How about doing the best with what we've got? <laughs> I like that. Doing the best with what we've got. Not being too overly optimistic, nor being too pessimistic. What else? Union with God and the kingdom. Say it again. Union with God and the kingdom. This kingdom will be later, but it's the kingdom. <coughs> yes, it deals with Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But what does that really mean? 
I can tell you, as a good Presbyterian boy growing up, uh, my parents taught me my, my Presbyterian catechism, and I learned to love Jesus at a very young age, but I didn't understand that. Because the way a Catholic can, and probably should, understand God's will on earth is a little different than the way a Presbyterian might understand it, and quite radically different than some other people, like Muslims, or maybe especially atheists who wouldn't believe in God, but their idea of a perfect society. You know, it's very interesting when you look at the history of human thought, how people have tried over and over and over again. They have worked try to try to make a better world than the one that they inherited. And they were always faced with what I would call double vision. On the one hand, they looked at the world in which they lived, and they saw problems, they saw difficulties, they saw challenges, and then they imagined in their mind what a better world would be like. We see this both in the political writings of ancient Greece and Rome, like Aristotle and Cicero, but we also see it even in the dramas of ancient, the ancient world. For example, one of my favorite of all ancient Greek dramas is the story of Antigone. Perhaps you know it, in which Antigone tries to persuade her sister to disobey the law of the king, King Creon, who has decreed that their brother must not be buried with the honorable burial, burial rites that were due him. And so they defy the law. It's one of the first treatises that we have about civil disobedience. But then we come through the medieval age. We find, I could talk about everything there. It's amazing what was written, Thomas Aquinas himself. But let me jump very quickly to the time of the Renaissance, where we had many modern or early modern utopias written where people then began to think more clearly as they were thinking historically and linearly, they were thinking, how are we going to make a better world? Our great saint, St. Thomas More, I now teach at the high school and named after him, um, he wrote a utopia, but his utopia is quite different than other utopias. For example, let's contrast that with Sir Francis Bacon's New Atlantis, which is like a utopia as well. What is that good society? What should we be striving for? This summary sort of begins to lead us in the right direction. And at the end, we'll see something from Archbishop Chaput that might help us a little bit. But we'll get to that in due time. If you notice on the outline that I've given you, I, today what I'd like to do is to make a argument and a plea. Argument in the sense of a logical argument, a plea with you as my fellow Catholic Christians to ask the question, what, are, what is a realistic goal for our world, for our role within society? And there's a number of factors which impinge upon that. And I think they can all be summarized well in the phrase, Lord, bring your kingdom down on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, we are, as Paul implies in the book of Colossians, God's secret agents. He says in Colossians chapter 3 that, our, that we have died with Christ and our life is hidden with Christ in God. Remember that epistle of Dignatus that Monsignor introduced us to last night? Where it says Christians have the same language, they live in the same cities, they do the same things everybody else, except some crucial thing that shows the real difference. You see, we look like other people. We shop like them, we pay bills like them, we drive cars like them, but lo and behold, there's something different inside. And it's that something different inside that is heaven on earth. And this is why uh, I think Monsignor alluded to it, perhaps even brought it out very clearly in the last talk, and that is, that's what makes us different than the utopias of early modern Europe, or certainly the Marxism of the 19th century. 
You see, because most political thinkers today, most social thinkers, when they think outside of the Catholic and Christian context, they think about rearranging the players on the chessboard. That's what's going to make a good society. Catholicism stands in the background and says, no, no, that'll never work. Because if you don't change the person on the inside, you'll never have a better society. So that's what I want to share with you today. Let's look at that just a little bit more. If you look on the diagram there, I'm going to suggest today that we should avoid two very unrealistic extremes. On the one hand, there are those that we might call the Pollyanna Christians, and they have an unrealistic optimism about what can be done. Now, we haven't seen much of this lately because most Christians today, both Catholic and Protestant, are on the other extreme, and that is they tend to have a pessimism about the world that we're living in. I look out upon the audience today and I see faces that are roughly at least moving toward the age that I am, and I think that therefore you can remember when times were different. Let's not go way back to the 1960s when I was a child. Let's just go to the 1980s and say who in 1980 would have had the audacity to suggest that two men could be married, even in 1980, maybe even 1990. Right? Who would have had the audacity to think that we could banish all religion? But that's the goal of the materialists the secularist, to ban banish all reference to religion from public life, certainly not in the America of my childhood. And I thought I was isolated in Florida, but then I asked my friends in California and my friends in New York, and they said it was the same way there, then. Things have definitely changed. There's no doubt about it. And most Christians probably are faced with the temptation to what I would like to call an unjustified pessimism. Why is it unjustified? Because we believe that the virtue of hope is a theological virtue, meaning it comes from God. It doesn't come from the world in which we live. So no amount of assessment of the world around us will give us hope. But only God, the Holy Spirit, working in our hearts, can give us true hopeful, a hopeful spirit. And that is what I'd like to leave you with today, as it is on the outline. These two words that we should take out of this conference today, a hopeful realism. It's a realism about the world that we're living in. We don't lie to ourselves, but at the same time, we look out upon that extremely imperfect world we look at it with the glasses, the lens of hope. And in doing so, we ask God to empower us to be able to bring his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And if again you want to remember one phrase out of all that I have to say today, it would be the one there under hopeful realism in which I said, I believe one way to put this is that God is calling us to address the temporal realm, be it medicine or law or business or engineering, it doesn't matter what it is. Whatever area of life God has called us to, God is calling us to address that temporal world by infusing it with the eternal world. Now let me ask you this. I bet you asked this question when you were a child, if you were brought up in any kind of a Christian home. I remember when I was about five years old, and I walked in the kitchen, and I said, Mom, I don't want to go to heaven. My mom was really worried. <laughs> Kenny, why don't you want to go to heaven? You know, she's not the youngest atheist in the world <laughs> at that time. <laughs> Kenny, well, why don't you want to go to heaven? And I said, because, they don't play baseball in heaven. <laughs> no one to play baseball. But I remember asking my mom too. My mom was a very devout to this day, a very devout 
Presbyterian Christian. I love her dearly. I remember asking her at one time, Mom, where is heaven? Because I knew the sky was there and there was outer space and all of that. And of course, it couldn't be down there because that's hell. So was heaven up there or over there? Where was it? So where is it? Wichita. <laughs> you see, you learn something new every day. <laughs> where is heaven? Your relationship with your love with God. I'd like to use the metaphors that are so beautiful in a book that I hope you've all read. It's very simple. I've read it to my children and I've read it to my grandchildren now. The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Remember in the story when the children go into the old professor's house and they start exploring the big house and Lucy, the littlest one, goes into a room and there's a wardrobe, the British word for a freestanding closet, right? And she enters into the wardrobe and as she tries to hide from her brothers and sisters, she turns around and lo and behold, there's a world she never imagined. Remember how when she goes into Narnia? And she's gone and her words and ever so long time. She comes back through the wardrobe and as she says to her brothers and sister, didn't you miss me? I was gone ever so long time. And they say, what do you mean? You just went into the room two seconds ago. But you see, time in Narnia is not like time in England. Heaven is just on the side of the other door. It's the dimension that's around us. It's a fourth dimension. The only problem is we don't have the access. We don't have the key to get through that door, that portal. But the portal is, I think you're right. The portal for bringing heaven to this earth is in our heart. It's in knowing and loving God and being the sort of incarnation, as it were, of the Lord's grace and mercy and love in our hearts. And that's why we can be hopeful realists. We can look at the world and not, not try to cover over sin, not try to cover over our own faults or our weaknesses, but we can look at them with the hope that things, by God's grace, could be better. So what I'd like to do today is to talk about three kinds of realism. The realism of engagement, the realism of resources, and the realism of strategy. Now, we Americans are very pragmatic people. Now, I can tell you that I am the least pragmatic person in this, absolute, in this room. I, I know that by certain. I am as impractical as you could possibly imagine. I'm a theoretician, and I'm a poetic type, and I could spend the rest of my life as a hermit. And I, I have no desire to do anything that is what we would call active. But I'm a father. I'm a husband, a father, a grandfather. And so my calling is to do, is to bring the contemplative realities into the active world. And I'd like to suggest that that might be true for all of us. In order to do that, we have to first of all understand the war or battle that we are engaged in. That's what I call the realism of engagement. And in order to understand that, I'd like to read for just a moment and if you have a Bible, you're invited to join me from the sixth chapter of Paul's epistle to the Ephesians. If you remember Ephesians, this is that one letter where he talks about the church in all of her glory and beauty as the mystical reality of God, God and God's people in the world. When he comes to the end of the epistle, he comes to these words. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on 
the whole armor of God, so that you may be able to withstand the wiles or the, uh, what's the word, the devices of the devil. For our battle is not with flesh and blood, but with powers and authorities and world rulers of this darkness, with the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. In other words, he's, then he says, and because this is true, he says, put on the whole armor of God. One of the things that drew me to the Catholic Church out of my Presbyterian uh, ministry was the awareness that the Catholic Church possesses in itself the fullness of God, His grace, and the sacraments, the truth. And there was always something yearning within me, sometimes fallow, sometimes conscious, but it wanted more. It wanted the truth. It wanted not to be deceived by self. And so Paul says here, put on the whole armor of God. Now the word that's translated here for our battle or our warfare is a word that's sometimes used in ancient Greek to mean wrestling. And I'd like to use that metaphorically for just a moment. To think of what we're involved with. We are wrestling every day with the devil. But you see, as I've indicated on the diagram there at the beginning of the, uh, the outline, we need to see our lives on two levels, on the visible level and on the invisible level. It's as if we are watching a drama unfolding. We're in the audience and we see on one level that there are human actors, the people that we live with and interact with every day. But on a higher level, that the figures are a little sh more shadowy. We can't see them exactly. We can't always make them out. These are the spiritual forces of wickedness that are trying to use the world to the ends of the destruction of God's kingdom. Now, don't jump to conclusions. But here's what we're doing is we're not just wrestling on, on this level. We're wrestling with those spiritual powers by our life of prayer, by our life of, of active and good works toward others. You know a book in the Bible? In fact, I encourage you to go home and read this this weekend. If you haven't read it, read the first two chapters of the book of Job. Because that's exactly the picture that I've just given you is the story of the book of Job. Remember Job and all of his troubles and all of his struggles? But we also get the glimpse that he doesn't get. And that is, we get to see into the courtroom of heaven, and there Satan is saying, look at Job, he'll deny you. And the Lord challenges Job back and says, oh no, you can do anything to him, just don't take his life. And so Job's struggles, which he cannot understand from God's perspective, you and I can understand, because we're looking at both levels of the struggle. That's what we're involved in every day of our lives. Every moment, every young mother who lovingly changes the diaper of her infant child, like my daughter who just had her fifth child and who's educating her children at home, she's working against those spiritual forces of wickedness. The religious sisters that I work with who have given them their lives to those young people and they love them deeply as if they were their own flesh and blood, they are fighting against the spiritual forces of wickedness. You see, what St. Paul is teaching us here is very simply this. We are engaged in this battle, whether we want to be so or not. We could be unprepared, but the point is we need to be prepared. And how do we do that? By addressing the temporal world on this level, with the realities of heaven. It is by infusing the temporal world with the eternal world. And so, we go on then with the understanding then that we are engaged in a spiritual battle. You know, it's funny how you can read scripture for so many years 
and not quite get it. When I was in seminary, I went to a Protestant seminary, of course, and uh, I remember I you know, read the text in Matthew chapter 16 dozens of times. You are Peter on this rock and will build my church and the gates of Hades or hell will not prevail against it. You know, we think of that often as this, that Satan is trying to destroy the church, right? So we've got the doors locked, we've got the gates up, and Satan's trying to beat down the doors of the church. He's trying to get inside the church and destroy our lives. But listen to the text. I will build my church, and the gates or doors of hell will not prevail against it. We are not on the defensive. We are the offensive. We are destroying the kingdom of the evil one, you see? And so that's what I mean about being aware that we are a part of that engagement in the, against the spiritual forces of wickedness. And that's why we need the second thing. And that is the realism of resources. That is, we need to understand that God has equipped us He's given us what we cannot do in and of ourselves. I am now, uh, he mentioned that I'm doing this Eucharist project, that's true, but I'll, I'll talk about this in just a moment, a little bit more. But I also do something I never thought I would be doing, and I'm teaching high school juniors theology. And in this process, I have learned an awful lot, probably more than they've, that I've taught them, I've learned from them. Not about theology, but about human nature. <laughs> and here's what I've, one of the things that, I, that I've come to see very, very clearly is that young people are looking today for the same things that I was looking for, and I'm almost three, I'm over three times their age. And I suspect that those who are three times older than me were looking for the same thing too. And it comes down to this. It's very simple. It's an authentic faith where people really believe what they believe, what they profess to believe, they really believe it. And they're seeking, however imperfectly, to live it. That's relevant to understanding the realism of resources that we have. We have not been left alone. The Lord gives us the tools, the weapons to engage in this battle. And what are those weapons? Those are the weapons of the sacramental economy in which he has given us in the church the strength that we need to engage the battle. But the problem is, I think, that oftentimes we don't really believe what we say we believe. What do I mean? by that. About 10 years ago, a priest in Indianapolis asked me to come and talk to his men's group. He was very happy to do it. He had been a, a good confessor to me when I lived in Indiana, and so I was glad to come. There were about, oh, I don't know, 30, 50 men there that Saturday afternoon. These were just ordinary, you know, men of the parish. And they came together, and I gave them several talks. I hadn't even planned to talk about this. But I just happened to mention, oh, well, you know, we need to be careful about Pelagianism. And they said, Pelagianism? What's Pelagianism? And I said, oh, well, you know, the idea that you can save yourself. That you just pull yourself up by the bootstrap, be a better person, and then you're getting to heaven. And one of the men blurted out, that's Catholic. And I said, with all due respect, sir, no, that is not Catholicism. That's Pelagianism. That's the belief that we can save ourselves. If we can save ourselves, then why do we need a Savior? And so, as I was explaining, I was, I was using this illustration also to my kids because I'm, they're finally beginning to get it. That grace is something we don't produce. Grace is something we cannot produce. We cannot save ourselves. We need God's grace to be able to do this. But God is so gracious.
that he's provided us with this economy of salvation in such a way that grace can do more than you could possibly imagine. I was talking with some of the senior young men the other day, they're about ready to graduate and so forth, you know, and they're 17 and 18 years old, and well, that says enough of it right there, that they're 17 and 18 years old and they are, you know, on the verge of having to step out into the real world. So as I was trying to share with them about what that might look like in the next four, five years of their life, I tried to remind them that they are going to face challenges in college, moral challenges, and in jobs and whatever it is that they're going to, that they are not going to be able to overcome. And that that is why God gives us the sacrament of confession and the sacrament of the Eucharist, so that they can be fortified to do that. And then I gave them an illustration which kind of shocked them. But it won't shock you. I said to them, young, young men, let me give you an example of God's grace. 20 years ago, 25 years ago, I was committing sins that I could not stop committing. I had a compulsion to commit those sins. Today, I have no desire to do it. Maybe once in a while it catches me off guard. But I have no desire commit those sins anymore. And I said, you see, that's the key to overcoming sin, is not to desire it anymore. It's not just to hold yourself against it. You have to do that at first. But it's to desire not to do those things anymore. Or positively to do the good. And to be motivated from the inside out. Grace can do more than you think. And that's what we need in order to uh, engage the spiritual battle. We need the realism of resources in our lives. If we're going to address the temporal world by bringing the eternal into it, we have to be channels, we have to be recipients of grace first. But then let me also make this point, these three points. When we think about, when we consciously think about what it is that we're trying to do, Here's what I think we're trying to do. In whatever realm of life God has called us to do, and me, it's been education my whole life, my whole adult life, I ask myself the question, what about how do I bring the, the transcendentals of truth, goodness, and beauty into the realm of education? And I have friends sitting out here today, both new and old, in which you know from your experience, in whatever your area of life that you've worked in, whether it's law or medicine or whatever it may be, you know how difficult it is to do this. But what do I mean? Truth. I think it was you, Monsignor, that said that the Oxford year of the world, or the, the word of the year, post the word of the year yeah. was post-truth. You know what I'd like to say? That's either the beginning or far along the road of being post-human. Because we were made to understand and to grasp truth. And the way that at least I've tried to do that in the past is to ask people, and they always give me the same answer to this question. I said, if you imagine yourself to be on your deathbed, you are now ready, you know you're going to die in the next few hours. Will you be able to be happy knowing you have lived a lie? And almost always, I get the same answer. No, I don't want to live a lie. But if you, want to, if you want to, don't want to live a lie, then you have to embrace truth. And we're having a problem with that these days. I don't have to tell you that. But why? That's the interesting question. Why? because of the word that I've begun with today about realism. The problem is not that we don't really believe in truth as a proposition. The problem is we don't want to face reality. In other words, our ontology is messed up. 
It's not just that our epistemology is wrong, our ontology is wrong. We're not willing to face reality. We're in a place, for example, where a man could call himself a woman and demand that, that he be called and treated as a woman, regardless of the physical reality in front of them. And if that's true, then what else could possibly be true? Truth is indeed at stake. In my next talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about the four kinds of truth. And so I'll talk about this a little bit more. But here's what I want to, uh, to urge you with. That whatever it is that God is calling you to do in this time, this place, this space, it is to bring in some sense, to bring people back to truth. And the simple distinctions that will, are obvious to most of us, Believe me, there are people that don't know or understand it. Let me give you an example. When I was in graduate school, back in the 1980s, I had a professor, one of my doctoral minors was the philosophy of science. And I really loved that subject. I probably would have majored in that if I had learned about it earlier. But as I was studying, I had a professor. She was a practicing lesbian. She was my favorite professor. She was a kind and wonderful woman. So sometimes we would go out to lunch together. And she never asked me about my religion, but I think she kind of knew that I was one of those, you know. But we got along. And we talked about science and various things and so forth. And as we went out to lunch sometimes, somehow we got on the subject of, of discuss, the possibility of discussing differences about society. Exactly yeah, what it was, I don't remember. But anyway, I said this to her. I said, you know, today there's an increasing emphasis upon diversity. You ever heard that word? <laughs> Let's emphasize diversity. Right? That's the great emphasis today, especially in educational circles. And I said, you know, I think that we might find more harmony in our world today if we emphasize not so much what makes us different as what makes us the same. That is what unifies us, not what divides us. This woman, believe me, very brilliant, brilliant philosopher, she bristled. Oh no, 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 we can't do that. And I've never seen her react that way to anything that we had discussed over the last you know, three or four months that we had known one another. Why did she bristle like that? Here's an intelligent woman who can look at things from multiple perspectives, but she couldn't see that there was a, at least something worth considering in that statement. You see, what do we have? We have people that there's certain things they are blind to looking at. It has been really, really hard for me and being 30 years in higher academia is to admit the fact that people, I'll be gentle and say, they can be brilliant people in their fields of knowledge. They can be highly intelligent and they can be moral morons. They absolutely do not see the issues clearly. They have to understand that's part of the realism. And sometimes I'm tempted to think on that, remember the, the two levels? That there's an invisible level working there that is beyond the human. But what I have to do is I have to come back with the realism, but let's remember there really is a such thing as truth. Two plus two does equal four. A squared plus B squared does equal C squared. And so forth. You see, there are truths to be remembered and to be embraced. The second one, I was kind of leading into that, is goodness. Intuitively, we can all recognize goodness. But theoretically, at least academics, are not willing to admit it. Let me give you an example. I'm going to ask you to judge whether this is right or wrong. Oh, let's see. What do you call State University? There must be some, there must be some nice... There's shockers here. Okay. There must be some nice benches on the campus of the university. 
I suppose you're strolling along the campus. And there you see a young woman. She's about 25 years of age. And she has taken her blouse off. And she's exposed her breasts. Why has she done that? Well, because she's nursing her child. Now I ask you, has she committed a cultural wrong? When most people in America react and say, she shouldn't do that. Think? Oh, what did you say? They were. Has she committed a moral wrong? Because women in Africa all the time expose their breasts and feed their babies. Is a mother feeding her baby off her breasts a good thing? Yes. That's a very good thing. Yeah. Isn't it? And so anybody, and by the way, anybody that walks down the street and sees that young woman, maybe they're shocked at first, because we don't do that in America, but they thought about it. And would any normal, rational person say, oh, that's nice, that's a good thing. She's fitting with me. Unless they'd somehow been twisted by some kind of medical ideology. Would you agree? Now, suppose the next day you're walking down and you see from a distance, oh, there's that young woman again. She must be feeding your baby again. And as you come by and you get close to her, suddenly the baby bites her breast. And she takes it in and says, you little brat! <laughs> and she smashes the baby against the sidewalk and kills it. Good? No. Or bad? And you know that it's good or bad. And would any normal, rational person say, oh, that was good. But she killed her baby. In retaliation for biting it. You see, goodness can be recognized even if people are unwilling to articulate. And that's what we have to appeal to, is their intuitive ability to recognize the difference between good and evil. Now, what can happen, what does happen, in any given society, as Monsignor alluded to about persons and non-persons, is that we can so convince ourselves of certain belief systems that we can categorize people in such a way that we have betrayed goodness in some way. However, what do, what's the antidote to that? We're in a spiritual battle, so what's the antidote to that kind of thinking, to ideological persuasion that, that makes us immune to goodness? The answer, reality. Look at the reality again. And part of the natural moral law is what fosters human goodness, human reality, human community, human bonding. What are the things that do that? And so then finally, and I'll talk about this again in the next talk a little bit more, there's beauty. This, I think, is probably the lost dimension of our evangelization, of our changing the world around us because we either don't understand beauty very well or we're not sure that it's actually going to do any good. But here, briefly, I'll appeal to the history of the church. I left it in my room, but you know that little book, Magnificat, you use it? You notice what's in every every monthly a copy of them? There's some kind of a discussion of art and our piece of art in the back. And what it's trying to do is trying to sensitize people again to be able to see with an, the eye of love. Because love responds to beauty. I was reading a paper by a priest recently. And I was kind of amused by it, but it's really true. He was saying that, he was talking about beauty, and he said that you have a bunch of men sitting in a room, and suddenly a woman comes in, and she's a fairly attractive woman or something, and it's like, you know, all their eyes go to this woman. Why? That's an instinctive response. 
to beauty. Right? Now, of course, it could become wrong, but it doesn't have to be at first. It can be simply beauty that you're looking at. We live, if you'll forgive me for saying so, in a really ugly world. And not only is it ugly because of things that are being done, like you would expect a murder and all of those things, we live in a world in which people love ugliness. Now, if you want to write down a, a scholar who's talked about this, Roger Scruton, S-C-R-U-T-O-N. Roger Scruton is an English philosopher of aesthetics, and he's done some beautiful videos for the BBC about beauty. And he's got one of them, in which you really need to see this. It's about an hour long. And in the video, at the end of it, it's an amazing contrast. But I gotta tell you that beforehand, he's talking about the effect of beauty upon people. And there's one point at which he talks about the contemplative, contemplative dimension of beauty. And in the, in the video, there's this Asian woman sitting on a park bench. And there's the green is all around her. And you can see in her eyes this sort of, she's entering into another world in her heart, in her mind. And that's what beauty does for her. It either lifts us up or it lifts, takes us down. Now what Roger Scruton has so beautifully elucidated is how the 20th century, here I use the word, art, has really been one experiment in ugliness. Now not being an art historian or artist, I was afraid to say such things because I thought I might look stupid. But here's a man who understands the history of 20th century art. And that video that was made by the BBC shows it very, very clearly. At the end of the video, then, there's in a shopping mall, I don't know if it's America or England, but there's a shopping mall of people are going and coming and so forth. And there's a string orchestra there. And they're playing the Stabat Mater. And there's a beautiful soprano and a counter tenor. And they're singing in, you know, a sort of communion response to one another as the orchestra plays. And people stop and they just listen. And in the midst of this busy, frenetic world of buying and selling, they take a moment and they see the beauty and they listen to the beauty that's in front of them. I don't know if this is something that you might be interested in doing, but if you want to do evangelization, make Wichita beautiful. And I mean aesthetically beautiful. With good art, with good music, with good theater. All of those things which enhance the human, the human spirit. Why would we do that? Because we want to address the temporal by infusing the eternal. When we bring beauty in the world, we are bringing something of heaven into this earth. Finally then, the realism of strategy. And by that I mean that we look at the question of not what needs to be done, but what can I do? I have a confession to make. On my computer, I have between 10 and 20 books that I started, which I will never finish. I will die with those books still on the computer. Why? Because when my mind was in an expansive mode, I was writing down ideas for what these books would look like. But I only have so many years to live. And so the project I've talked with some of you about that I'm going to do, I hope that will be my last contribution to the church. But how did I come to that? Well, through prayer and the advice of a good friend, I came to realize what God wanted me to do and that I will not be able to do everything. Might I, say, might I guess that that's the same for you? What, what legacy will you leave in this world? And of course, the older we get, the closer we get to the end of our life, the more that question impinges upon us. What legacy are we going to leave? 
I don't think my wife would mind me sharing this with you. For 14 years, my wife and I went to two churches every Sunday or Saturday. You see, when I became a Catholic in 1996, my wife could not, in her conscience, join me in that step. But we had talked about the Holy Eucharist a lot and a lot, such that she began to see that our Presbyterian heritage was, let's put it mildly, incomplete with regard to the Holy Sacrament. The Lutherans believe something more than the Presbyterians believe, so she became Lutheran. So for 14 years, I went to, she and I went to Catholic Mass on Saturday night or Sunday, and I went with her to the Lutheran Church. Learned a lot about Lutheranism during that time. It was very educational. But when we were doing that, we always had this feeling, was, which is something we never wanted in our lives. You see, when we were growing up, we were told, her parents told her, my parents told me, that if you marry someone, you should marry, well, they would have said a believer. You should marry a fellow Christian. You should marry someone with whom you can be united in your faith, because that's the deepest and most important thing. Was that bad? Was that bad advice? No, oh, good. No, that was good advice. And so my wife and I married because we were both Presbyterians, because we shared that Calvinist faith, and we were all ready to go. You know, living a life, married life, together. When I became, or wanted to become, even before I became, when I wanted to become a Catholic, believe me, that was like tearing my wife's heart out, because. It was tearing us apart. We did the best we could. But for a long time, too long, we were not on the same page. And I can tell you it hurt her twice as much as it hurt me. Then, in 2010, after 14 years, we went to Rome for kind of a second honeymoon at the bequest or the, you know, the bequest of a, a good Canadian Catholic friend of ours. When we were in Rome, now by this time, Sharon had been exposed to really good Catholicism at the Newman Center where I worked, the Apostles of the Interior Life, all kinds of good Catholic people. Most of the prejudice had, prejudices had fallen away. But she still couldn't make that last step. We went to Rome. We spent two weeks walking around the churches of Rome and praying, and she'd say, what does that mean, you know? And so if I explain, well, that's from the fourth century, or that's from, you know, Leo the Great in the fifth century, or something like that. We looked at the bust of Trajan that's there in the Vatican museums. And she just got a sense of the history of the church. And then one day she asked me, I really believe that it is Jesus. In, in the Eucharist. And I said, well, I don't understand what's holding you back from becoming Catholic. But on that trip, I had determined beforehand I would not say a word. So I prayed, but I didn't say a word. And I knew my friend that had given us the money to go, she was praying for him, but she wasn't going to say a word. On the way back, flying back across the Atlantic, Sharon says to me, I'm deciding. When we get back home, I want to become Catholic. <laughs> and it's taken well, five years or so, <clears throat> but more like seven years now. But we have grown that close in our hearts in that way. And in doing so, she has um, affirmed my vocation as a Catholic scholar to do the work that. I can tell you about later, as much or more than she's ever from anything in my life. She wants me to get about doing this work. In other words, she says, I want you to leave a legacy. And that's what I ask you today. What kind of legacy are you going to leave? But in doing and trying to determine that, do not be, do not uh, try to bop 
box God in. Let him surprise you. How did he surprise me? 30 years, or almost 30 years, including graduate teaching in the uni universities, I had sort of retired. I was still doing something, but I, I thought I was out of teaching forever. And then in the summer of 2015, suddenly I started having incredible chest pains. And it took me uh, a couple of weeks or three weeks or more to get into the doctor. And when I did and got on the treadmill, the doctor immediately shook me off and I had open heart surgery. My widowmaker artery was 90% long. And I was gonna die if I didn't, if that wasn't there, taken care of. In the period of recuperation after that, as I began praying, reading a little bit more, I got a phone call. And they said, you know what? We are in desperate need of a theology teacher at the high school, the local Catholic high school. I can tell you that before that moment or before those last week, I would never in the world have thought I would ever teach high school. Why? because I just don't know how to relate to them. So I thought, God surprised me. So I said, well, if you're desperate, okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll help a little bit. So I was there a couple of days, and they said, you know, we're looking for a new theology teacher to replace the other guy. Could you stay a couple of weeks? And I said, oh, right, I'll stay a couple of weeks. A couple of weeks. You know what? Can you see the rest of the semester? All right, yeah. You can, you'll have time. That'll give you more time to really look for somebody of high quality. And then the end of the semester comes around. I said, can you stay one more semester? <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, well, okay. I'll stay one more semester. And the semester goes along, and they say, would you consider coming back next year? And you know why? A lot of reasons. And yes, it was an adjustment, there's no doubt about it. The maturity level is not that of college students, I can tell you that. But you know, I tried real hard, and God gave me the grace to come down to their level, and to understand not only intellectually where they are, but, but, but personally where they are. And you know what, I have a great relationship with 90% of those students. I never thought in my life I'd be able to relate to teenagers but I do. Let God surprise you in what he has for you to do. Let God show you his will in leaving a legacy in maybe a way that you didn't think you would want to do. And so I think that leads us then to the final thing I want to share with you today. And that is kind of a biblical exhortation about what God would have us to do. Let me ask you to look at this for just a moment. This is from Archbishop Charles Chaput uh, of Philadelphia. In this new book that he has written called Strangers in a Strange Land, he says, we have the duty as Catholics to study and understand the world around us. We have a duty not just to penetrate and engage it, but to convert it to Jesus Christ. That work belongs to all of us equally, clergy, laity, and religious. We're missionaries. I think one of our speakers earlier today said something like that. We are missionaries. I like the way he puts it down. That's our primary vocation. It's hardwired into our identity as Christians. God calls each of us to different forms of service in his church, but we're all equal in baptism. And we all share the same mission of bringing the gospel to the world and bringing the world to the gospel. 
When I was about 18 years old, I went to a Presbyterian college, and I was going to be a missionary. In fact, my desire, I wasn't going to get married, because I didn't want the kids to grow up in the jungle. So I was not going to get married. I was going to, be, I was going to go into a jungle and literally live my entire life in a jungle. That's what I was going to do. And why? Because by God's grace, prior to ever becoming Catholic, I realized the missionary calling that was true in my baptism. As an infant baptized into Christ, I was called into the, to be a prophet, priest, and king along with our Lord Jesus Christ. You're called to the same thing. So, as Mother Teresa says, what the saints have always said, our mission is not success. Our goal is not success, but faithfulness. Let me share with you Paul's words that I earlier quoted from the book of Colossians. In Colossians, Paul says this, You, he says, have been buried with Christ, or rather he begins this way, If you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated on the right hand of God. Seek the things above, that is, set your mind on the things above, not on things of the earth. For you've died, and your life has been hidden with Christ in God. Whenever Christ appears, he is our life, then you will appear with him in glory. Set your mind on things of earth, on, on things of heaven, not on things on the earth. You know, I love the prayers. It's either in the collect of the Mass on some days, or at the end of Mass, it goes something like this. Lord, help us by knowing the things of heaven to judge rightly the things of earth. That's our judge, that's our, our task, is to be so infil filled and infused with grace and heavenly glory, that it just comes out of us naturally. Those young people, those 16-year-olds that I was telling you about, you know what they're looking for? They're looking for authenticity. The same thing I was looking for. The same thing generations before me. Because that's human. It doesn't matter what age you grow up in. And that authenticity can only come when we draw on the realism of grace, the sacraments, to empower us, to make us more than we can possibly be. The word, the Greek word that Paul uses in this text is a word that particularly phroneo, which we get the word phronima. Phronima means not just to think, but it means to be fixated on something. Fix your minds on the things of heaven, not on the things of the earth. And similarly, in Romans chapter 8, there Paul says that the mindset, same word, phronima, he says the mindset on the flesh leads to death. The mindset on the spirit or of the spirit leads to life. And so the answer, the first answer to changing the world is to be changed ourselves and to become the change that we want to see in others. When I look out into our political situation, when I look out into our educational situation, if somebody suggests to me that the solutions could be financial, that the solutions could be strategic, that the solutions could be rearranging the players on the chessboard, I wouldn't like to describe to you what I feel like needs to come out of my mouth. <laughs> Why? Because nothing is going to change until people are changed on the inside. Monsignor was talking about poverty. And I had a discussion with a friend recently about that. And he talked about the culture of poverty. I don't know, you probably know more than I do about what that really means. But I do remember as a teenager, our illustrious 
President Lyndon Johnson and his war on poverty. Am I historically correct? Mm -hmm. So now, after 65, 75, 85, 95, 2000, here we are, beyond 2015, and the, pro the war is won, the problem is not solved. <laughs> Why did the war on poverty not destroy poverty? You've got to ask that question. And I think part of the answer is going to come back. It's not just that we needed to put more money in it, that we needed to put more, rearrange things on the chessboard. Somehow people had to change. Both people that were poor and people that weren't poor needed to change. We are absolutely unique, I think, on the face of the earth. Baptized Christians are the only people that have a final solution. And that is the solution that comes from the transformation of grace. When we are willing to address this temporal world with the values of the eternal world, then and only then will we be, maybe be heard or even have a right to be heard. I'd like to close this discussion right now with one final passage out of Scripture. It actually came up in the Gospel reading. I think it was on Thursday's Mass. It's the story in the third chapter of the Gospel of John when Jesus and his disciples go into the land of Judah. They spend time there and Jesus begins to baptize. And John was there baptizing, it says, near Salem. And there were, because there was a lot of water there, and there were many that were coming to him and being baptized. But John was not yet thrown in prison. And then it says there was a dispute that came up between the disciples of John and the Jews about ritual cleansing. And they came to John and said, Rabbi, the one who was with you across the Jordan, about whom you testified, behold, he is baptizing and all are going over to him. So they wanted to introduce the question of competition between Jesus and John the Baptist. And John answered and said, and here's what I want to focus on. A man can receive nothing of himself but what is given from heaven. However your mission is articulated, however you understand that, it needs to be from heaven. And that's why it needs to be the result of prayer in your life, of consulting with a spiritual director. Lord, what mission do I have? Now, for those of you that are deeply entrenched in life already, it's probably obvious. If you're married, you have children, it's your children. You know what? There's a phrase, and let's to correct me if I'm wrong here. I can't remember where it is, but in... One of, the, one of the Second Vatican Council documents, it says that children are the supreme gift of marriage. Is that right? Something like that? Effect? It sounds like I'm a spaz, but I can't. I think that's what I was going to say. Yeah. Children are the supreme gift of marriage. I, I guess some people would say I've been successful. Written several books, taught your schools, and all these things kind of thing. You know what? It means nothing compared to the supreme gift of marriage. Because my children and grandchildren mean everything to me. Those are my precious gifts. The, the success of life. So even as a grandfather, I've found out that being a grandfather is much more than I realize. But it's part of the beauty. That's the legacy that I want to leave. What will be your legacy that you're going to leave the next generation? God says, Look at the world around you. Address this temporal world by infusing it with the values of heaven. And the way they come into this world is the same way Jesus came into the world. By divinity taking on human flesh. Not ontologically the way Jesus did, but by us being the channels of grace within the world. So Lord, Change the world, but change me first. And then help me to be your agent in changing the world. 
In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.